you wouldn't know it from the very small extract we've read from the Gospel today. But the parable Jesus tells is part of an answer he gives to a question. This question was asked quite a long time ago at the beginning of chapter 24. After they've left the temple, following a series of encounters with the authorities, his disciples ask Jesus questions that include what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And the rest of chapters 24 and 25 are Jesus' various answers, warnings, stories, parables, a bit of ethical teaching. And this parable is the third of three, and they all seem to be about timing. Jesus is warning his disciples that if anybody can tell you when the end is going to be, then they shouldn't, they shouldn't trust that. It's, it's not true. Not even he, the Son of God, will know uh, when the end will be, only God the Father. So we have the three parables. Uh, the first is about a servant uh, who has started mistreating everybody else and abusing his position. The second is about ten virgins preparing, or not preparing as the case may be, to meet a wedding party. And then we have this one about a master who gives money to his various servants, going away on a journey and then coming back. Now, I've heard lots of sermons based on this parable and they've been about things like using your God-given talents to the best of your ability. They've been about various uh, versions of the Protestant work ethic. They've had a certain element of, look busy, Jesus is coming soon. And those are versions that make sense. The question is, what will be the sign of the coming age? It's a story about a master coming back when they're least expected and people having to give an account. It looks like a fairly straightforward answer to the disciples' question. And yet, parables wouldn't be parables if they were that obvious. On reading the text really closely and carefully, there are a couple of, couple of things that strike me as quite odd. Some of you might know that I work for a local government pension scheme, and we invest in things in order to produce an income through which we can pay the benefits to our members, so people who've retired or are on ill health. And we have to look at how much of a return we can get on our investments. And, you know, that will range from about 4 or 5 to percent on the more safe bets to about 9 or 10 percent on the more interesting, sophisticated uh, investments, which might have some social or local value thrown into them. But we'd be very suspicious of somebody who said that they could get you returns in high double figures. And if we thought there was somebody around who could give you a 100 percent return, we'd know it was a scam. The first thing that really strikes me about this parable is that the master applauds and gives praise to two people who have made a 100% return on the money he gave them. And it wasn't a small amount of money in the first place. A talent, it's reckoned, was worth about 6,000 drachmas. The drachma was the daily wage of a soldier in the armies in a couple of centuries before Jesus' time. Your average squaddy would only see a talent after being in the army for about 16 or 17 years. These guys have been given two talents and five talents, amounts of money that people probably wouldn't ever see in a lifetime, and they've gone away and doubled it. I'm not sure they did that in ways that could be described as moral or legal. I'm not sure they would have done that in a way that they could say hand on heart, we have done this in a way that is faithful to the law of Moses. There are people who can probably get you returns like this. They're usually called organised crime, but anyway, if these are the people called good and faithful servant, then this parable is 
probably much stranger than we think it is. The second point is, is very similar. When the third servant comes along and presents the man with his talent, you know, it's still the same talent, it's exactly the same amount of money, he hasn't lost anything. When he presents it, the master criticises him. You should have put it with the bankers. But again, remember the context of this conversation. Within the Jewish community, would it have been thought a good and ethical thing to have been putting money in the bank and therefore making a profit out of usury? The end of the age that the disciples are looking for now sounds a lot stranger. It might be easy to think that the master who's gone on the journey and come back is supposed to represent God. But what if it's not? What if this is people being judged by the corrupt authorities of this present age, who look at the vast profits that people are able to make and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my kingdom and I will give you even more. And which looks at the man who faithfully keeps the talent intact and hands back the property. He's not misused it. He's not lost it. He's not skimmed a bit off the top of it. He's done what the law of Moses would have expected him to do with it and says, what? No, no. You should have gone away and made money with this. The third servant is rightly afraid of the master because he turns out to be a bit of a psychopath. He gives the third servant a big dressing down for his failings, takes away what he's got and gives it to somebody who has already demonstrated that they are very corrupt indeed, and then beats him up and throws him out in the street. Not just the street. In some place where... There will be great suffering. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, the disciples have asked. And Jesus tells a story in which the corrupt and probably criminal are hailed as the good and faithful servants and the people who do what is right, who will not play the master's game, are thrown out. The disciples asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus has replied with a story about somebody being crushed by a corrupt world. And however strange it might sound, this is the gospel of the Lord.